Praise the Lord. Father, we ask you to continue to bless and prepare us for what you have for us, that we might not only receive it, but obey it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week I said I wanted, Lord willing, to be speaking on prayer, where I believe the church needs some instruction, where we may be missing the release of faith, something to hinder the release of it. But I've entitled the message, Five Reasons for Believing God Will Answer Your Prayers. Five reasons why you should believe God is willing to answer your prayers. Not only will, but willing. And we'll just jump right into it. The first reason is because He says He will. Why should you believe that God would answer your prayers? First of all, because He says He will. In a lot of places, but how about Matthew twenty-one, twenty-two? All things, not all things, but... All things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. Now, in spite of that, yet when most Christians pray, they have a big question mark in their mind. Now, you know that because that's the way you were. And some, I guess, still have a question mark from the reports we get and the counseling we have to do. Most people, when they pray, have a big question mark in their minds about what they're praying about put there by the teaching of the unbelieving churches that taught you, taught everyone, still teach to pray if it be thy will, whatever God has said, you put an if on it and that proves you're humble and pious or something, also proves you don't have any faith. And so in effect what they have Jesus saying, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive if it be my will, which of course is reasoning in a circle. I don't think we should have to be told that, but it's reasoning in a circle. And we'll never get anything if we add ifs to the promises of God. Now, of course, you might say, well, I already know that, but why is it some of your prayers are not answered? Maybe you've got a question there at times when you shouldn't have a question. You should have a period after a promise, never a question mark. If you don't know the will of God, then, of course, that's another matter. But we've all been brainwashed, and some of these things begin to surface when you're going through a real trial or when you have a big financial need or whatever. There may be a question mark in your mind sometimes, subconsciously at least, and so you want to guard yourself against it because most have been brainwashed. I remember several years ago speaking on a religious college campus, and they asked me to come and give my testimony, and I did, and I cited Mark 11.24, which I always do. I think in every message, somehow it gets in. That's the key to our ministry, key to the Bible, key to the message of faith. What things soever you desire, when you pray, if you believe you receive them, then you shall have them. And so the sponsors of the meeting had a question and answer period after, which I soon learned after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit not to participate in, but... You know, early when you're trying to get your message ministry exposed, you put up with a lot of things that you really know better about because if you haven't heard me say it already or if you haven't discovered it, any time that you invite questions from the audience in meetings where you go to speak, you're really not inviting anything that will edify the other people there. You're inviting the skeptics and those who oppose what you've said to stand up and preach a little sermon. They don't ask questions. They preach a little sermon to show where they disagree with you. Or if they ask a question, it's so designed that it will put you down or let the people know that you're wrong and that they don't agree with you. So I learned early not to participate in question and answer sessions, but we did it at first. Almost one of the first stood up with a pained look on his face, one of the students. And remember, I'd cited Mark 11:24 to believe you have received when you pray and said, well, that would be presumption. That's telling God how to answer our prayers. Well, I said, in effect, no, that's letting God tell us how he wants to answer our prayers. After all, you know, Jesus said that. They act like you made it up. It's something you invented and you're trying to impose it upon them. Certainly, it's nothing they've ever been taught to believe you have received when you pray. But he was horror stricken at the thought of a bold prayer of faith. And he would have rebuked the centurion in Matthew 8 when he said, to the Lord, you don't even have to come to my house. You just speak the word. And he was bold, you know. He said, I'm a man of authority too. I know you can speak a word of authority in the spiritual realm because I speak with authority in the military or physical realm. I can't imagine that student ever saying that to Jesus. He would have been on his knees begging and pleading, if it be thy will. But the Syrophoenician woman who wouldn't take a no for an answer, he would have rebuked her. He would have said, you're being presumptuous. 
And she just kept pressing him by faith. And Jesus commended her for her faith. And remember, as we've taught you, she didn't even have a promise. She was a Gentile. And he said, it's not proper to take this healing and deliverance and this message to the Gentiles. I've been sent only to the house of Israel. Of course, for that time, later to the Gentiles. But she kept pressing in by faith. And Jesus commended her and she got what she wanted. How would you like this student... How would you like him to have been one of the elders of the church if you were sick and called for them to come and pray? Well, we read in James 5, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, he would have substituted bawling and begging for believing. And if for faith, he certainly was no Jacob who wrestled all night with the angel of the Lord until the angel blessed him. And remember, the angel of the Lord was the pre-incarnate Christ, the Logos. Which brings to mind the Logos Horema error, faith and presumption teachers, who tell us that the written word is the Logos. It can be translated word, but that we can't believe the written promise, let's say it's for healing. The Logos, that's just the Logos. We have to pray, if it be thy will, about the promise, which he said is his will. And if we get a word from heaven, then they arbitrarily call that Horema, which is another Greek word which means or can be translated as word. And so he would have rebuked Jacob and said, Jacob, turn him loose. That's the Lord. It's presumptuous to be wrestling with a logos. You should be praying, if it be thy will, to get a raiment from heaven to see if it's God's will to bless you. Because that was the logos there that Jacob was wrestling with. But he would have rebuked him for Jacob's boldness. And God commends him and blessed him, by the way. And so presumptuous to pray boldly. Maybe that's why you're not getting an answer, because according to Hebrews 4 and verse 16, listen to what the apostle tells us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace and help in time of need. Now, the Greek is even stronger than that term translated here boldly in the Greek is fearless confidence. So if this unbelieving religious generation is having trouble with the English translation, come boldly, I don't know what in the world they're going to do with the Greek, which says to go before the throne with fearless confidence. Now, we have to have proper respect for God, and we teach that here, and the Bible teaches it, but I didn't write this again. This is what the term means, to come with fearless confidence before the throne. So you can have assurance that God wants to answer your prayers because that's the way he tells you to come. How can you have assurance that he will answer your prayers? First of all, it's because he says that he will in many passages. There and, well, Matthew twenty-one, twenty-two that we gave you. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And so, who are we going to believe? God who cannot lie, and he makes us these promises, are some glob of flesh and bone Standing in a pulpit here today and gone tomorrow, who wouldn't believe God if he appeared to him? He'd think he was hallucinating. I'll choose God rather than some glob of flesh and bones like myself. You know, that's all we are. We're just grass and like a flower of the field here today and gone tomorrow, according to the Word of God. But the Word of God, we're told, lives and abides forever. So I'm going to believe the Word. Even the backslidden prophet like Balaam had more sense than a lot of the religious skeptics of our day. Because he said in Numbers twenty three nineteen, God isn't a man that he can lie. Neither the son of man that he will repent, of course, of anything he's promised or said. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And so, I'm going to believe what he said in his word. Then we need to keep in mind, too, that Jesus always rebuked any form of doubt. Oh, my Peter actually walking on the water. And then when he began to sink, instead of commending him, he said, O thou of little faith, little faith, why did you doubt? And when the ship was sinking at sea, or seemed to be, to the disciples, of course it couldn't sink with the Son of God there. How's the Son of God going to be drowned and redeem us at Calvary? But anyway, they didn't know all of that, I guess. When they awakened him, he rebuked the storm and he said, Where's your faith? Where is your faith? That's what he's saying to us. And the demon-possessed boy that they couldn't deliver, Oh, wicked and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? In other words, you're going to have to learn to do these things yourself. And then he told them later why they couldn't. He said, it's because of your unbelief. 
And so, Jesus is saying in Matthew 21, 22, that don't ask me for anything unless you ask believing. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Because he's saying, in effect, for you to pray about a promise like that and then to tack your petty little if on it, if it be thy will, is not pious or glorifying to God. But that's presumption. That's presumption. To look his promise in the face and then tack a petty little human if on there. Which they don't do, by the way, about John 3.16. They don't say, if it be thy will, save me. We said, first of all, the reason you ought to be willing to believe God is willing to answer your prayers when you pray is because he says he will. Another reason, and this seems to slip by so many of us, and that is he wants to answer your prayers because he loves you. If you're his child, he wants to answer prayer because he loves his children. Now, that ought to be enough motivation. And yet, strangely, when people really get down to it, they're really hard pressed. They don't really believe that. They believe that God loves maybe the world, John 3.16, but that he's kind of maybe overlooking them. Let's look at some passages, two or three. They're all together, John 14, 15, and 16. And here we're told that God will answer the prayers of his children because he loves them. John 14 and verse 21. We'll start there. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he that obeys me, is he that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And this is all in the same context, all the same evening. There we establish the fact that both the Father and the Son love us. And then in chapter 15, look at verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So continue in my love. How do you do it? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now notice how that's tied in with verse 7. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, as I already said in 9 and 10, you must obey Him to abide in His love. So He's saying here, if that obedience abides in you, then you can ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. So he said he loves us, and if we abide in his love by obeying him, we can ask what we will. And then he makes it quite plain. And remember, it's still the same evening. He's still talking. John 16, 23, 27. He didn't speak in chapters. It should have been all one discourse. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now look at that promise. Why would people beg and plead with a promise like that? Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Now ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Then down to verse 26. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I will not say to you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you've loved and received my word. Now he's already said, ask the Father in my name, and he will give you what you ask. And then he says in verse 27, because he loves you. The Father loves you. John 14, 15, and 16. And again, because of unscriptural teaching, though, it's difficult to get, well, even charismatic Christians to believe that God really loves them and delights to answer their prayers, to bless them, to heal them, to provide for them, simply because he allows you to go through a trial and you suffer a little pain, let's say it's a healing matter, doesn't mean he doesn't love you, but because he does love you, he's maturing you in faith so that you can stand when others are falling away because they've not developed faith. The time's coming when you're going to see this unbelieving church go into Babylon. They're going to follow the beast. They're going to follow the world church system because that's the only way they can buy and sell and exist. But the picture that most people seem to have of God, that of a stern judge that dispenses his favors to those who beg and plead long enough and loud enough. Instead of seeing God, the Father, as Jesus said we should depict him when we pray. How did he tell us in Matthew 6? He said, when you pray, pray to the judge, pray to the absolute, the 
infinite one that no one will ever see and can't get near. No, he said, pray our Father, which art in heaven. Give us our bread. Deliver us from evil, and so on. Pray our Father. You ought to re-listen those tapes on prayer that we dealt with Matthew 6, the so-called Lord's Prayer. But it's not his prayer. It's the one he told us to pray as a model. There he said, think of him as a loving father who loves you far more than your parents could love you if they tried with all of their heart. Because his love is infinite, it's perfect, it's pure. And everything that he promises you, he will do for you. If you meet the conditions, of course. But he does it because he loves you. I've got a passage here in Proverbs 15 and verse 8. Listen to it. The prayer of the upright is God's delight. He delights in your prayers, if you consider yourself upright, that is, a child of God. And Jesus said here in John 15, Ask the Father in my name, and he will give you what you ask because he loves you. If you abide in my love, you can ask whatever you will. John fifteen seven, He said, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. In Luke chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. In his righteousness, and all of your temporal needs will be provided. And then he says in the next verse, listen to this. Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's delight, the Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. Now those verses go together for a purpose. He didn't put those two statements together as if he said two different things. But he's saying there, the Father loves you, so if you'll seek the kingdom and God's righteousness, then he will meet all of your temporal needs. Remember Matthew 6, the same discourse, he said five times, you don't even have to take thought. But after he says that if you seek the kingdom, that is if you're obeying God, that's what we're talking about, then he'll meet all your temporal needs. Then he says, not only that. Don't fear about your temporal needs, little flock. He says, it's the Father's delight to give you His kingdom. And so, my, my friends, I don't see how anybody has any problem with believing God for finances or healing. Those are the easiest things. Those are elementary. And those two things are where most people stumble. And anybody that stumbled in faith assembly has stumbled at those two points, finances and healing. The ones who departed, the ones who had any trouble, were having trouble over faith teaching for healing or confession, or they didn't hold fast, or whatever. And whether it's childbirth or whatever, you know, you're to approach God in faith. We don't tell you how. We have no position on it. We'll get that said and over with. We've got a tape on it that says we're not in the childbirthing business. But we do tell you, whatever you do, do in faith. And that doesn't mean we're telling you what to do or what not to do, but some things are not faith, so don't do those. And so he's saying here, why do you fear about finances and healing and things when the Father is giving you the greatest thing of all? He's promised and given it to you, and that is eternal life and his eternal kingdom. He says it's his delight to give you his eternal kingdom. He delights in giving it to us. Now, there's so much involved in what he's giving us in his kingdom that there's no way to put it into words. It's such a tremendous gift. And he said that, Right after saying, why are you, he's talking to you at Faith Assembly and everyone else who claims to be his child. Why are you worried about things like finances, clothing, shelter, or healing or whatever? When God the Father loves you because he loves you, he delights in giving you the greatest thing he can offer you. And that's eternal life and his eternal kingdom. David had the message. He wasn't struggling with faith. Psalm 23, 1, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. So I'm not going to lack. Psalm 34, 10, he said, they that seek the Lord, that is, obey and follow the Lord, shall not lack any good thing. Because the Lord loves you. You're not going to lack any good thing. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Because he delights to give you the desires of your heart. Well, I added the second delight there, but he's already said it in Proverbs 15, 8. The prayer of the upright is a delight to God. He delights to hear you pray. Think of that when you're praying, when you're going through that trial. You don't have to beg and plead and convince God you've got a need or that he should recognize the trial you're going through and do something about it or whatever. He loves you. And delights to give you what you need and what you're praying about. But it's so difficult 
to convince. And I'm talking about faith assembly. When it gets right down to death's door or lose the business, the marriage seems to be breaking up, gets right down, then they have to come for the prayer of agreement, say. And they've been sitting out there for years. Or they come with their questions and problems, been sitting there for months and generally for years. Or they take the easy route. They don't really believe God will do it this time. And so like one couple, they told me they took their baby to the health department to see what the skin disease it was supposed to be contagious was. Been sitting in faith assembly a couple of years. Well, we haven't excommunicated anybody who lost their faith unless they lose John 3.16 faith. That's another question, isn't it? But the point is, such a person doesn't really believe that their Heavenly Father, I don't know if He is or not when you lose faith, but the one they call their Heavenly Father, they don't really believe He loves them. They believe in divine healing. It's amen. Yes, I believe everything He's saying up there. Until it's their child. Their child. And then they're not sure He really loves them. And so they'll do a little begging and pleading and inquiring and searching. And they know if they go to the health department or the doctor, they don't have to beg and plead. All they have to do is ask once. And they'll just jump on your side right away and minister to you and help you any way they can. You know what you're saying? That you believe that the health department or the welfare department or the social agency or the doctor has more compassion for you and your need than your Heavenly Father. That's what you're saying. That's sad. You know how God must feel. Oh, yes, He can feel. And it pains and grieves Him to look down and say, He and the other ministry have faithfully preached my word, taught them that they can trust me for anything. And what if they had to go through a financial trial? Or what if somebody in the family died? Trust me anyway. Job did. Trust me anyway. And God says, now look at them. This one or that one. Praise God, it's the minority, but we have to warn about what the minority is doing so that the majority may not fall into the same snare because it's a severe trial. He looks at that and he says, my hands are tied. I offer them everything. Not only financial blessing and meeting their needs, but divine healing. I sent my son to the cross who suffered and died. My ministers have faithfully shown them from the word of God in Isaiah 53, what the Hebrew, what I really said, not what those who sometimes translate my word says, that surely he's borne our diseases and carried away our pains and with his stripes were healed. And Matthew 18, 16, 17, how that... That's applied there, Isaiah 53, to the healing of the sick. How my son carried them away. So my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do because they won't believe me. They don't believe I love them. That's what you're saying. You don't believe God loves you. With finances, so with healing. I remember years ago when I was speaking in a certain city and the house where I was staying, I was preaching the message of faith and they were receiving it and... They said, but when we first received this experience, we didn't know about God wanting to bless us financially, meet our needs. And we had this big financial need. It was quite a sum of money at that time. And someone suggested that we ask God for it. And they said, ask God for money? Well, we don't pray for money. They were former Presbyterians and you were never taught to pray for money. That's mundane and secular. Of course, I know the people who teach that do a lot of begging and pleading and pulling for money for the educational plant and starving Armenians over in somewhere and whatever. March of dimes. And then you wear a pin I gave. But anyway, (laughs) we don't pray for money so they convince them, well, you ought to. You pray for other things. And so to make a long story short, they said, we did. We had never done it before. We asked God for the money. came right in the mail, right away. You know, in a couple of days or whatever. They learned that God loves them, that he was concerned about that thousand dollars or whatever it was they needed. And he was proving to them that he does love them. Well, that's what he says here. He says, seek you first the kingdom of God and these things that everybody's seeking after will just be given to you. And he says, don't fear about your material needs or whatever, little flock, for it's your father's goodwill to give you everything, even his kingdom. 
Luke 12, 31, 32, if you want to mark it down, because Matthew 6 records the same thing, but doesn't mention that. That's the Father's delight to give you everything. Because, John 14, 15, 16, He loves you. Well, I believe it. He loves me. And I don't have to plead and beg. If I see a promise in the Word and I've claimed it, then that matter's settled and I can go on to other things. I don't have to go to brother so-and-so over here and say, well, I'm really going through a big one this time, whether it's financial. I need $10,000. One time I needed $10,000, you know, needed it to buy some new books to have them published or whatever. And I have people come and want me to agree with them for sums of money like that. And I mean they're not novices in the faith walk. Or they'll ask, can I do this or that about it? You know, how to pray and so forth. And I remember sitting on the edge of the bed and just saying, Father, I claim Mark eleven twenty four for the $10,000 and I believe I have received and I thank you in Jesus' name. I have it. I mean, I think it was the next day that it was in the mail. It was already on the way. I'll say more about those kind of answers later. But it never occurred to me, you know, to go get a prayer of agreement or call up somebody and see if I could do it or whatever. I just claimed it and there it was. And that's not an isolated incident because it's rare that I even mention money to the Lord. And it's not because, like these Presbyterians, I haven't been taught properly, but I don't have to. I just walk in the faith of Matthew 6. But occasionally, where there's immediate need, God may allow things, you know, to see if you're still in there believing or whether you're taking Him for granted or whatever. But what I'm saying is, I don't have any struggle trying to believe He will give it because He loves me. And I believe it. And sometimes when I admonish you or rebuke on occasion we have, it's because we love you. Oh, I really love you. I really do. I pray for the church. I do love you. Thirdly, why should you believe God will answer your prayers? Is because you do those things which please Him. Now, that's assuming you do, but we're saying you should believe God will answer your prayers because you do those things which please Him. This is 1 John three twenty one twenty two. 22. Why aren't your prayers being answered? Well, maybe this is why. Now, beloved, verse 21, if our heart condemn us not, we can have confidence toward God. There's that confidence again, fearless confidence, that whatsoever we ask, whatsoever we ask, just like Matthew 21, 22, all things whatsoever we ask, whatsoever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his word and we do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Now, the assumption is, of course, that you meet the condition here. And then the promise is we can have this confidence because we do those things which please Him. Now, of course, if you don't do those things which please Him, you know, if you're not walking in the light you have, if you're spiritually lukewarm, these are familiar terms, if you're disobedient, if you're critical, if you're resentful, towards your husband or wife, if you're unforgiving, if you pray in doubt, you're not going to experience the confidence he's talking about here when you pray. Now, I trust that you've prayed enough and you know enough about the prayer of faith to know when you're releasing faith. And isn't there an assurance or confidence in our hearts when we know we're walking in obedience and the light we have and we have something to base our faith upon some promise in the Word of God or some faith principle, and you pray and release faith and you have the confidence that He's heard and already answered your petition. Now, the manifestation is something else when that happens, but you can't have that confidence except you keep His Word, He says, and do what pleases Him. Like with me, I can pray in confidence, knowing that God will provide for my needs if I have to pray about them. A woman came and said, why is it that my healing isn't manifested yet? She said, it's been about a year. I said, well, that's easy to answer. It's because you're not meeting the conditions. What? Yes, I said, it's Mark eleven twenty four. You don't believe you have received. 
When you pray, believe you have received, then you shall have it. You see, you have to go back somewhere and release faith and settle it once for all. Believe you've received, and then you shall have it. Because faith isn't involved in time. God isn't bound with time. He said, not I, Mark eleven twenty four. when you pray, do your believing. I've heard and answered your petition, then you shall have it. And we know the shall have, a moment or a month, or in God's time. We don't have to go into that again. But I said it's because... You're not meeting this condition. Here in 1 John 3, he said, You must keep my word and do what pleases me. Then you can have confidence that you're healed when you pray. And of course, she was not pleasing God because she was not praying in faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, you cannot please God. And so she could not receive what she was asking because she was failing one of the important conditions. You've got to please God. How do you please Him? With faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you've got to take Hebrews eleven six with 1 John 3, 21, 22. He said we can have the confidence if we obey the Word, keep His commandments, simply means to whatever He's commanded, we obey, not the Ten Commandments. He's not putting us under law, but whatever He said, we are to obey and please him. Another said to me, why am I not healed? As far as manifestation, it's been a long time. I said the same thing to him. Faith never asks, why am I not healed? The reason faith doesn't is because faith received the answer when you prayed. I said, you've never received the answer. You've never taken it by faith. You've never believed Mark eleven twenty four. This happened to be a case where he even taught it himself. But I said, you haven't believed it. You've wasted all these years waiting on a manifestation that you've never received the answer or petition back there when you said you claimed it. Well, he said, I have to admit, I've had some doubt in my heart that I've tried to keep hidden. Doubt in your heart. Have you ever read James 1? If you ask for anything, he says, ask in faith, nothing doubting. If a man doubts, he says, let not that man think you'll receive anything from God. It's so plain. It's like, you know, we've never said it. We've said it and said it and said it. Doubt hidden in your heart? Who was he hiding it from? Certainly not God. God reads hearts like you read a newspaper or magazine. And God's the one that has to answer. He was keeping it hidden from us. That didn't mean a thing. We don't answer the prayers. I wouldn't if I could, if they're going to doubt. If God said, I'll let you answer a couple of prayers. You know, something you can do. You know, just I've got the money and they need it. And they say, I had a dream last night or a vision. The Lord said, you give me some money. But I tell you, I don't know. I doubt I'd give it to him. If he said it was up to me on the basis of what I've taught you in my word, I'm going to send somebody to you that desperately needs $100. I've spoken to them in vision that you've got it and you'll give it to them if they'll believe it. And if they came in doubt and God said, it's up to me, make the choice. I don't think I would give it to him. Why should I? Come on, some of you sentimental emotionists out there. God has some rules and conditions and requirements. I wouldn't have the heart to give somebody that wouldn't believe God something. Now, we're just using an illustration. Don't bog down into all of these, well, if they're hungry and got a need and all that. I'll feed them. I'm talking about the hundred dollars they claimed. and God said I had it and give it to them. Then he told me, you do like I would do. Uh Uh-oh, I'm supposed to like he does. Amen. So, who's he keeping his doubts hidden from? The one who answers his prayers. (laughs) Never occurred to him that he could never get it because he was doubting. I guess he thought if he kept it hidden from us that somehow it would work out if he got lucky. Well, a fourth reason... Why? God wants you to believe He will answer your prayers. Your prayers. I know you'll answer mine. Because you're asking according to His will. That's the fourth reason. First John five fourteen and 15. You know that God will answer your prayers because you're asking for what is His will. You can see why we stress the need of the study and discipline in the Word of God. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the word. Study, reading, hearing. And why does faith come by hearing the word? Because the word is a revelation of the will of God. For whatever. How to walk, what to say, healing finances, 
salvation of your loved ones, just name it, and there is a teaching, a principle, or a specific promise, or prohibition, or whatever. And so the reason we stress the Word is that's where you learn His will. And once you learn His will, you can pray with confidence. There's the confidence again. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we have this confidence in Christ that if we ask anything according to His will, and you learn that from His Word, then He hears our prayers. And John said, we know that if He hears our prayers, we have, past tense, the petitions we ask of Him. Already have them. If you can get Him to hear your prayer, you have the answer to it. And again, don't bog down in the manifestation. That's something else. Now, the reason I wasn't healed of kidney stones and two years of pain that I suffered back in 1950s, the reason I wasn't healed is because I didn't know how to pray according to the will of God. And so I prayed, you know, something along the line that a good Baptist would pray. Now, Lord, the doctors have been practicing medicine on me. And they don't even know what's wrong. See, we didn't learn it was kidney stones until later. Even the passing of the blood and two years of pain. And they really practiced medicine on me. I had one doctor, and that's back in the days of the doctors. I quit them a long time ago. As best I could, even before I got the baptism. But even had one, and I learned later that's dangerous. You can kill nerves by doing it. He actually put alcohol, and you can kill people by doing it. Alcohol in a needle looked like something you stick in a horse. And I learned later it was referral pain. You could have a kidney problem and hurt over here. I don't want to get into the medical aspects, but the acupuncturists follow that philosophy. They stick a pin in your toe to heal a headache. You know that much about it. And so it was the referral pain. It wasn't here where I was hurting. It was back here. We didn't know it was kidney stones. They didn't know. I wasn't supposed to know. No training in medicine. But he stuck a needle in me and put alcohol under the skin to kill the area where the pain was. He had this idea he was going to practice on me to see it was just some sort of a nerve, a short circuit. But anyway, I said, Lord, I've had medicine practiced upon me long enough I'm tired of spending my money and polluting my body with drugs and having them cystoscope you and, oh, you don't even need to know what that is. You don't want it. And I had that two or three times and they couldn't find anything. I said, I'm through with trusting man. I'm turning my case over to you. And I had James 5 open. That's way back, like 59, before I ever heard of the baptism or divine healing. And I was over in James. I didn't know any elders to call, so I didn't call for any elders. I didn't know any who believed it or who would do it. They wouldn't even know what kind of oil to use. But I claimed it anyway. I said, I'm turning my case over to you, and if it's your will, heal me. I'm through with the doctors. If not, like Paul, give me the grace to bear it. Second Corinthians 12. Of course, there's no evidence Paul was ever sick, but you know the theology. His thorn had to be, and you name it. Some sort of a physical ailment. But as I said, so often if you read Second Corinthians 11, Paul didn't act like a sick man. Somebody they were leading around by the hand because he was blind or whatever. But do I have to tell you how that little scenario came out after praying, Lord, I'm through with the doctors. I'm turning my case over to you. If it's your will, heal me. If not, give me the grace to bear it. I don't have to tell you how it came out. No healing because of no faith. And no faith because I had nothing to base faith upon. Because I didn't have the Word of God taught me or in my heart to base any faith upon. And so it is, you can't release faith in any confidence, as John says, if you don't know the will of God. But he says we can have this confidence if we know His will and then pray, then we know we have the petition. You've already got it. Now again, there's another promise. So why do you have to go back and pray two or three more times? Or think you have to beg and plead and remind God that you're still going through the trial or sick or the baby's suffering or whatever. He knows that the first time you ask him. It doesn't mean there's sometimes not other things he shows you to do, like rebuke this or that. He may show you that. We're talking about having confidence when you pray that you have the answer because he says here you're praying according to his will. And of course, since receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the truth of divine healing... I can pray with assurance. I've prayed for myself and seen all kinds of healings and 
prayed for many, many hundreds of people and seen all sorts of supernatural healings because I've learned what His will is about sickness and healing concerning His children. And so I've never spent a dime on medicine since 1966 and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Medicine, doctors, hospitals, or whatever. But some skeptic, you know, generally get into a meeting or are already there and they're saying, well... I don't know. And so there's no point in going any further with that person trying to convince them because that's where they've got their hang up. You know, you'll give them a testimony about healing or supernatural things or baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever. And they'll say, well, I don't know. You know, they've been taught other things. And that's where they're hung up. So you have to start there. When you don't know, you can't pray in faith. He tells you here in 1 John, you can have the confidence if you know. His will. And so when you don't know His will, then that's where the hang-up is. And so what I would do is ask them a question, not try to deal with that, because they've already said they don't know, so you know why they're not getting answers to prayer, not getting healing. The question you ought to ask them is, why don't you know? Is it because you can't read? You know, it's in the Word of God from cover to cover. Divine healing, if that's what we're talking about. Oh, no, I can read. I learned to read in the first grade. It was English? Yes, I can read English. (laughs) Well, then it must be you don't believe or you're unable to believe what you read. Oh, no, I can believe it. If I see it in the Word, I'll believe it. Well, it must be you're blind, and so you can't see. No, look, I can point out objects. I can see. And then probably what you ought to tell them, Oh, I see what your trouble is. It's those glasses you're wearing. Those skepticals with the denominational tint. (laughs) But you've got to take those off or you'll never see it. And I know this is true because I've been through that one back in 1966 when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd suffered the heart attack in the hospital. I'd been praying for God to take me deeper, to do a deep work in my heart. And I had a physical heart attack. Through that, I had this beautiful spiritual experience as a result of... A former teacher in the seminary where I taught, he came to me when I was home kind of recuperating. That's what we called it in those days. Now you just talk about walking it out by faith. You know, if the trial is still on, but he came and I had written the big prophets book, Old Testament prophets. And it happened to be that he was the manuscript editor by the company that said they wanted to publish it, which is Moody Press. And rather than talk about the manuscript, though he didn't mention it, he began to testify how he'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and his wife, and she had been supernaturally healed of an incurable thing that the doctors couldn't cure in a prayer service in a church after they'd received the Holy Spirit. Well, I had all of these answers. From the Word of God, I thought that he was mixed up in things that he ought to have better sense. In fact, I just couldn't believe he was saying what he was saying. As I was there answering in my heart, inside all of these things he was saying, I would have a proof text in my heart because I was really skilled in the letter of the Word. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I sent him here. This is what you've been praying about. You've asked to go deeper, do a deeper work in your heart. You've asked me, what is the missing element in Christianity? There's no power in the church today like the early church. He's telling you. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I did what you're going to have to do if you haven't, or anyone has to do. I took my denominational skepticals off long enough because he was quoting some scripture. And when I was willing simply to listen, as the Spirit implored me to do after all that praying, I should at least be willing to listen to somebody he sent. I saw it just like that. I mean, instantly I saw it. Just as soon as I was willing to take the skepticals off. With the denominational tent. I never fought or opposed the baptism or speaking in tongues or healing. But I didn't know anything about it any more than you did before it happened. And so you've got to be willing to take them off. Because you've got to pray according to His will, and you cannot see His will when you're looking at Christ through a creed. You've got to be willing to look at the Divine Son, not through somebody's doctrine, but through the Holy Spirit's eyes.
Please stop your machine at this point and turn the tape over. And so you've got to be willing to take them off. Because you've got to pray according to His will, and you cannot see His will when you're looking at Christ through a creed. You've got to be willing to look at the Divine Son, not through somebody's doctrine, but through the Holy Spirit's eyes. And then, fifthly, you should believe that God wants to answer your prayers because you're asking in faith when you pray. Now, if you're not doing any of those things, you don't want to believe that God will answer your prayers because He won't. But it's because you're releasing faith when you pray. You're asking in faith. You're settling the matter. If you ask in faith, you've settled it. It's Mark eleven twenty four. What things soever you desire when you pray, release your faith, believing you have received the answer to your petitions, and you shall have them manifested. That's what He's saying. So it means that when you pray, you are to believe from God's side He's heard and answered your petition. And you are to expect the manifestation. What if you say, when? Well, when it comes. I don't know when. Sometimes it happens, you know, you've just uttered the prayer and it happens. Finances is a good example to use. You may be praying for $500 that you need that day, and you get it in the mail that day. Now, how did that happen, you suppose? That's happened so often that it's not coincidence. That you actually receive what you ask in the financial way we're talking about. The day you pray. That must mean it was in the mail on the way. Wonder why? Because God knew you were going to pray the prayer of faith on the day you needed it. You see, not a week before, or he could have used other means. But So he worked behind the scenes because he loves you. He knew that you were going to wait till the last minute, believing it was going to come. You hadn't prayed for it, but you asked that day because you were desperate. And it's already there. I think I told you some time ago, and teaching on prayer bears repeating, a true story about a woman who... Did that, prayed for $500, and it came right away. I mean, came in such an unusual way, it had to be on the way. Well, it has to be on the way already if it comes the day you prayed. In the mail, I'm talking about. If it comes somebody knocking on your door, he could simply speak in their ear. Somebody just prayed, go over there and hand them the 500 That can happen. But this came in the mail. And the story is so unusual how that... Three years before she prayed that prayer, a woman that she had worked for made out her will and left this one who had been in her employ $500 in her will. Well, she didn't die then, but she died, I believe, two years later. Don't worry about the details if you find the tape I told this on because the outcome will be the same. I didn't go back to find the book or whatever I read it out of. So the woman died, and for a year, the... Lawyers were trying to find her because they'd given the money out to everybody, but this one woman, they couldn't find her. And it so happened she was moving around, you know, like from Arizona to Washington State to Pennsylvania and that sort of thing. So they would get her last address and no forwarding address sometimes. They finally located her. That's three years after it was put in the will. They finally located her, made sure it was her, sent her the check. And it came the day she prayed for it. And then she learned all of this later, how that the lawyers had been searching for her. And you see how God had to work in all those complex circumstances, lay it on a woman's heart three years ago to put it in her will, wait till she dies, then have the lawyers searching for a year, and they find her in time to send it through the mail, which may, wherever they were, take several days to get to her. And everything had to be planned out just right down to the last day. And it happened that way. So when are you to expect the manifestation? Well, maybe right away. So expect it right away. Well, I'm praying for 500. That's all right. 5,000. Expect it right away. When I prayed for the 10,000, I just thanked God for it on the basis of Mark 11, 24. It was there. I'm almost positive the next day it was there. So it had to be in the mail. 
And then it may be that he touches somebody's heart over in London or Australia or Japan or Germany. You've prayed about a financial need. And they send it, not even air mail, by slow boat. We call it slow boat because it takes about a month, surface mail. It takes a long time. And so maybe God will allow it that way so that you don't look at circumstances. The deadline has passed. It wasn't one of those, I get it the next day. You need it the next day. But you're 30 days beyond the deadline. You just hold on anyway and believe that things won't collapse, that they won't take the car or the house or whatever. You won't lose your business. Just hold on. Brother told me they need a quarter of a million. And the deadline came and no money. And they could take all they'd paid. They'd paid a huge sum into this. They opened their mouth, he said, the lawyers to say, you know, that they weren't going to extend the time. And they said, we'll give you 30 days. 30 days came, no money. And at the end of 30 days, said they opened their mouth to say, we're going to foreclose. So we'll give you three more days. It even surprised them it was coming out, you know. And three more days it came. But that's 33 days past the deadline. So I don't know when it will come. God may allow that to see if you're talking faith or just talking words. Oh, God knows people talk words all the time. You can get into faith assembly and still be talking words. Some do. Wouldn't be you, but some have. Or it may be like I told you about the man who claimed the bacon and eggs. He said the eggs were there the next day. He said, no bacon. I waited a week. And the same man who brought the eggs a week later brought the bacon and said, I disobeyed the Lord. He said, take that man some bacon and eggs. You know, he'd claimed that. And of course, bacon, he would have to buy, I guess, and eggs maybe had chickens, whatever the reason. He said, I disobeyed the Lord. He said, take bacon and eggs. Well, God wants you to get your eyes off your circumstances. So that you don't go by the fact, you know, God knows best and bacon's not good for you and makes your heart beat faster or slower or something. You know, people take those old used cars, they claim a new one, and somebody comes along with an old clunker, we're going to give it to you, won't cost you a penny. Well, God knows best. New car might make me proud or whatever, and he sent a substitute. God doesn't send substitutes. You know the message here, Luke 11, 9 to 13. But if you ask for bread, you get bread. If you ask for an egg, you get an egg. If you ask for fish, you don't get a serpent. You get what you ask for. Jesus' words. He said, you get exactly what you ask for because that's the way you give to your children. What if a child came up to you and said, Daddy, I'm really hungry. And you gave them a stone. Well, he said you wouldn't do that. Well, why do you think that the father gives stones? And that's what some of those clunkers are, as far as any reliability. They're like a rock. And so God wants us to meet the conditions, praying in faith, releasing faith when you pray. And one condition that I want to deal with tonight, because it's a hindrance, and I believe the church has been missing it at this point, and that is we must be specific when we pray. We're still under the heading, you've got to pray in faith. The reason you can believe God will answer your prayers because you ask in faith once for all, you release your faith. But a thing that hinders that is a way that so many are praying. It's a hindrance. And he expects us to be specific, not to pray in generalities. To state in your prayer what you believe, what you're praying for, who you're praying for, what the need is. Or else you can't release faith. And a hindrance to meeting this important condition to the release of faith is the practice, and we hear it constantly, of the church being asked to pray for unspoken requests. This is a carryover from the denominational system. And how it got started, don't know. We're not trying to be critical of anyone, but it's constantly being participated in by faith assembly. You see, the denominational system has a prayer list. They don't pray in faith anyway. And so they just keep, you know, praying for the same things over and over and over. And the reason it's not scriptural is because the Word of God says in Philippians 4, 6, Let your requests be made known. Now, an unspoken request is a blind request that you can't release faith about. 
You say, well, that's let your request be made known to God. That's right. If you're just going to pray at home, believe for yourself, and count that sufficient, if you're praying at home, it's between you and God. But notice you have to tell Him. He already knows, but He says you've still got to make the request known to Him. How much more we have to know what it is in order to release faith with you. Unless we know who or what we're praying for, then I can't release faith. Now, it doesn't mean we have to know all the details, you know, some personal details. You see, when you ask for the church to pray, you raise your hand for an unspoken request. You're asking the prayer of agreement, Matthew 18, 19. How can I agree with you about something that I don't know what it is? Am I agreeing for something relatively unimportant or relatively important? Again, it depends on how you look at it, like a new car or a dying relative. You know, there's a little bit of difference. I might pray one way about a car with you and a dying relative another. Is it the salvation of your wife, that unspoken request, and she's sitting beside you and you don't want to embarrass her? Or a rebellious child, a sick aunt, or a sick cat? Yeah, people pray for the cats, and you may be wanting us to agree for your lame horse. How can I release faith if I don't know what I'm praying about? This is a carryover from denominationalism. I have people come with this attitude. I have a need, and I'd like for you to agree with me about it. I'll say, fine. Now, you see, I want to know what it is, so I know what I'm praying about. You can see the problems if they're asking for the wrong thing, say. But what is the need? Well, it's physical. Praise the Lord. What's the nature of the physical ailment? Well, the Lord knows. It's personal. Well, I'm sure He knows. But it's embarrassing. Embarrassing to who? He knows. You weren't embarrassed to tell him. And I've got to know you're not going to embarrass me or I won't know how to pray. Let's give some examples. If it's infection, that isn't embarrassing. Oh, sometimes it's embarrassing. They don't want to tell you where they're infected. That's really true. One young man wanted me to agree with him about an infection that he got through sin. You see? So you need to know what you're praying about. Because God isn't going to answer that prayer unless He's met the conditions, repented, and whatever. But let's say it's infection. I always rebuke infection, and I've never found an exception. If the person is meeting the conditions, generally it's manifested what we say immediately, within a few moments, or before they leave the service, or in a day or two. Because sometimes infections, you have to wait not that you don't believe you have received, but wait to see that it is manifest in the sense you now know it is. I don't pray for the Lord to give their bodies physical strength because they said, well, it's physical and He knows. Well, I can't pray. I can't release faith. But it's infection. You see, there's a way to deal with it. So I don't try to guess. Maybe it's their head. Lord, strengthen their body. Make them feel better. And sometimes women have said it. They could have dealt with it with the Lord, but they'll come and say... I have a physical need, and I'd like for you to agree with me. And I say, fine, what is it? Well, it's embarrassing. Well, you know, to whom? God knows, and I have to know to agree. Well, it's a female problem, bleeding. Believe me, we've prayed for a lot of these. I rebuke that and plead the blood of Jesus over. That's the way you pray for bleeding, whether it's varicose veins, a cut, or kidneys bleeding, or whatever. You rebuke that with the blood of Jesus. And again, generally, it stops right away. We've had a lot of testimonies on that. But you see, if it's a spirit of cancer, if it's lust, if it's epilepsy, if it's doubt, if it's fear, then I deal with the spirit. I have to know what it is. I don't know who's supposed to be embarrassing to, because if you want me to agree with you, I have to know what it is I'm praying about. So if it's a spirit of fear, you see, I don't deal with, Lord, help them to feel better or whatever, take care of the need. You have to deal with that spirit. You have to name it. And again, we've seen the results, so it's not like we're just trying to superimpose our views on it. I said, first, we can't release faith until we know what we're praying for. Secondly, the reason that we can't take unspoken requests and release faith for them is because what you may want us to agree with you about may not line up with the Word of God, may not be the will of God. And I've run into too many of these prayers 
where they want you to pray. You know, where I deal with individuals. That there's no way in the world. Like one man wanted me to agree with him that the whole city in which he lived would be saved. I said, I don't have the faith for it. <laughs> I said, if you've got that kind of faith, what are you coming to me for a prayer of agreement? Who ever heard of that? The whole city be saved. Why, if it was that easy, why didn't Paul do it? Why didn't Jesus do it? Well, I don't think I need to labor that point. How can I agree with that? Or some people want you to agree with them, they'll win the lawsuit in court. Or that my husband or wife will be saved tonight when you give the invitation. Maybe you wasn't planning on giving one, unless the Lord led you. Or saved by 9 o'clock Wednesday. I don't know why they pick out dates like that, but I've had that one all the time. Or somebody over in the southern state said, agree with me that God will give me no more trials. I've got enough already for a lifetime. I don't need any more. <laughs> Then you had to do some teaching rather than agreeing that trials are for your benefit and blessing. And God would be robbing you of eternal blessings if he answered that prayer. So he can't. And anyway, it's contrary to his word. People want you to pray. Agree. And some of those hands who get raised agree that God's going to give them a good wife. You say, what's wrong with that? They mean this time. Last time it didn't work out. Oh, Yes. You'd be surprised what you were agreeing about you didn't know about with these unspoken requests. So pray that God will give me the gifts of healing. Or make me a prophet or prophetess. They seem to be commendable desires, but you know, it doesn't work that way. According to 1 Corinthians 12, I believe I read it there somewhere, didn't I? That they're given out by the sovereign discretion of the Holy Spirit. He gives individually as He wills, not as you want. There really can't be any release of faith by the church. You may think that's what you were doing, but there was no way you were releasing faith about blind requests. Because you have to state, as he tells us here in Philippians 4, 6, your requests. Thirdly, another reason why unspoken requests are not in line with the Word of God is because it encourages some to lift their hands each week for the same need. It encourages them not to settle the matter once for all, and it's like the denominational prayer list, where they just pray over and over and over for the same thing until you either die or just give up because it's not happening anyway. You just give up the request and you quit raising your hand. One incompetent said to me when I pointed this out that you're not releasing faith when you just say unspoken request. This individual said, yes, it's true. I always lift my hand at faith assembly when they ask for unspoken requests. Because I've got this particular thing I have claimed is serious and important. And I thought, you know, that if I raise my hand every week, and I do, that somehow the prayers of the saints are going to help it, you know, come into manifestation. So I said, that's placing the responsibility back on God when you keep raising your hand every week. And he wants you to release faith. He wants you to settle it. He doesn't want you to keep coming to church and raising your hand. You haven't settled it. Fourthly. He wants you to be specific so you can personalize the requests. Not generalize, but personalize. We get requests like this. A sister in the body has been in labor two days. Let's remember her. Well, who is this sister? I want to pray for a person, not some abstract noun, sister. I can't pray for a person if it's just a noun, sister. We get requests, a brother in the body is really going through a trial at home or work or whatever. Let's lift him up. Well, who is the brother? Are you afraid of embarrassing him? Then don't request prayer because he must not be very bad off or in need if he's embarrassed to have his name presented. Now, you don't have to tell us what his trial is, that his wife is rebellious or black desire or whatever. And that happens, which is another story. But anyway, who is the sister or the brother? I want to know who I'm praying for. And anyway, I might know something about that sister that she's not believing. She's been in labor two days because she's been critical of the body. And I know she's not believing for the birth of that baby the way she should. So I'm not going to pray, you know, blah, 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 blah in tongues about her. I'm going to pray in English. Lord, you see the need. And I pray you'll open her heart and show her what she needs to know. See, I might know that, or you might know that. 
People tell me things all the time I didn't know. So you've got information out there that will help you to pray intelligently. Now, there's nothing wrong with intelligence, you know. Intellectualism is another ball game. But there's no premium on ignorance. In fact, God frowns on it. You take examples in the Bible. There's not a single instance where we're ever taught to come to the church and lift up unspoken requests. Paul's a good example. He's always requesting prayer. So he appreciated the prayers of the saints, and so do I. When I know they're praying about me, Paul would say, pray for me. That God will deliver me out of the hands of the enemies and restore me to you. Hebrews 13. Do you know he said that? I believe he wrote Hebrews, but here's some that nobody would question. Pray that God will give me an open door for the gospel that I can preach with boldness. Ephesians 6. He says, pray that God will deliver me from my bonds. Colossians 4. He wasn't happy in prison. He wasn't, you know, agitated, worried, didn't need a psychiatrist. But he wanted out. Pray that God will release me from my bonds. Remember my bonds, he said. Pray that God will set me free from prison. He said that to Philemon, verse 22. You know, you don't find Paul, and he's always requesting the prayers of the saints, saying in his letters, now I've got some unspoken requests. I'd like for you to pray about them. Believe with me. No way. He said, hey, I need out of jail. (laughs) Nowhere in the Bible are there any unspoken requests prayed about. Now, you're beginning to see the logic of that. But you see, we've got some questions in your minds, haven't we? Yes, we have. Like, in a body this size, 1,500 plus, what would we ever get done if everyone who had an unspoken request now began to articulate their needs and verbally? Because they're going to have to tell us who and what and why. Now, that doesn't mean details, but they're going to have to tell us enough so we know how to pray. We're not going to be praying if you need a new car, if you need a new heart. See, there is a difference. How would we ever get anything done if you had all these people standing up verbally? And it's so easy to raise your hands. You can have 200 raise your hands at once and you just pray one prayer and it's over with. Well, I'll answer that question with a better question. This is faith assembly. Let me run that by you again in case anybody misses. This is faith assembly. And it does amaze me when I look out here on the unspoken request and see just hands all over the place. What in the world does faith assembly need to have 50, 100, 200 people every week raising their hands, especially for unspoken requests? See, that's a better question. Why does faith assembly have such a need? Why would we have those repetitious needs week after week? Haven't you claimed the answer to that on the basis of the promises of God? You say yes. Now, some people say no, and then you ask them, well, why haven't you claimed it? Well, I wanted to wait to get church and have everybody pray, but you didn't tell us what it was. But 99% of the time, they do tell us that they have prayed about it. Well, if you've prayed about it, then don't you believe that God has answered your prayer? That's Mark eleven twenty four. We faithfully teach you are to believe what the Word of God says you have received when you pray. And you'll get it if you believe you receive it when you pray. So all we can say is you must not believe it. Now we're not talking about those times when we want the saints to join in together and pray about a need. I've requested that. Maybe going to a meeting and say, I covet the prayers of the saints and ask you to lift us up. We all pray together. Praise God for that. But I'm telling you what it is and who it's for. It's not an unspoken request. You know, when Peter got slammed in jail for preaching the Word, somebody learned of that and went to the church, and they were holding prayer for him. And we have to assume, that's why they put it in there, that their prayers is what got him released by that angel. Now, what if somebody who learned of Peter's arrest, you know, down at the temple or wherever he was preaching, came to the meeting when the unspoken requests were called for? He said, boy, I've got a Lulu tonight, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. I don't want to embarrass him. 
but it's one of the apostles. That's all I'm going to say. Unspoken request. <laughs> Somebody had to walk in that meeting with enough concern and said, Peter's in jail. <laughs> that would embarrass some of you probably. <laughs> what if you came in here and said, my husband's in jail. Let's pray for him. Well, we know what to pray for. Next thing is, why is he in jail? Then we'll know how to pray. Well, he didn't take his baby to get the shots or whatever, you know. And so the welfare department, blah, 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 school authorities, and they've got him down there and they're going to book him or take his child away. We'll pray one way that way. Non-payment of debts are he lost control and got back into his old boxing habits when he didn't get his way. He's not only fired because he hit his employer, but... He had a warrant sworn out for his arrest. Then we want to know, has he repented yet? Does he need deliverance? Obviously, he needs something. We'll know how to pray. What if they'd have said unspoken request? Peter would still be there, wouldn't he, in jail? The church should not be asking for unspoken requests. You see, because we can't release faith. Well, what if it's something I don't know specifically what to pray for? In the sense, I don't know God's will about the matter. It's the sale of a home or purchase of a business or whom to marry or whatever. I want to do God's will, but I don't know what his will is in this decision. Well, that's the way to relate it to the church. Then we know how to pray. James 1. If you will believe it, he says, If you lack wisdom, ask of God nothing doubting, and he'll give it to you liberally. And so we can pray with you that way. I've done that many times. So even when we don't know specifically what to pray for, we can pray for the revelation of God's will about the matter because we have the promise of James 1 on that, that he will give us a revelation of his will. Now, it is on time and way. Somebody's thinking, well, what if the unspoken request is sitting next to me? Oh, unsaved husband. I don't want to embarrass him. He'd never come back. Well, I'll reserve my answer for that one later, but my unspoken request is, my friend, I've been trying to convince her about the truth of divine healing, but she just, well, she just won't receive it. And so I don't want to embarrass her. I brought her tonight, and I want this unspoken request that she'll be healed in spite of, or it's my rebellious child, or my wife who opposes this jabber, she says, of my speaking in tongues, and... She's here tonight, and I don't want to embarrass her because I've claimed her for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and so on. And so, what if my unspoken request is here? What do I do? Well, an obvious answer to me would be, why don't you make your request public when they're not there? Then it won't have to be unspoken. But even a better question than that, have you claimed them? You claim that unsaved husband, rebellious wife, child, whatever. Don't you believe God heard you? And most people say yes to that. You know that. Before they ever raise their hand for unspokens, they've already claimed it. That is in faith assembly they have. But where do you find a verse in the Bible that says after you've claimed a promise, the next step is to come to church and get them to pray about it too. Find me the verse. You won't find it. That's a lack of faith, friends. Now, we're not talking about where you want the body to intercede with you for a specific request, if that's your desire to do that. Because I treasure the prayers of the saints and the intercessions and so forth. I've heard of two or three people who interceded for me when I went through that trial, recently physical trial. And the Lord showed them that. I appreciate that. But they knew who they were praying for. And knew essentially what they were praying about, a physical, you know, attack of the enemy. So there's no verse in the Bible that says after you claim a thing, you come to church and get them to pray about it too. Now, we're not trying to establish rules because we know there are times when you want the church to join in with you for something. If you want that, no problem. But you shouldn't be asking the church to agree with you that God will send you that new car or if your wife will get saved or whatever. Just use your faith. Countless people under the faith message, and not just here, have done that. They know it works. And so you don't believe you've received, is what we're saying, if you're lifting your hand. Well, you say it's so serious. 
Well, if it's so serious and you can't wait, instead of lifting a hand for unspoken requests, why don't you get another believer to agree with you, Matthew 18, 19. And if you can't find anyone, the pastor will do it. If it's in line with the Word, I do it all the time. The reason I didn't put myself first, because we'll have a line tonight. I always have. Anytime I've mentioned Matthew 18, 19, and some of them had to turn down because I said, God wants you to believe for that. And they've already claimed it. Because I mentioned Matthew 18, 19, they'll come up and I'll say, have you claimed this? Yes. Well, I say, God wants you to stand on your faith. Agreement is generally for baby Christians. Now, there are times when that isn't true. We know that. Like my wife and I, before we start out, always before we start out, we join hands, agree together for a safe journey, plead the blood of Jesus. Well, praise God. But we know what we're agreeing about, too. I don't grab her hand and say, no, I've got an unspoken request. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. It would be embarrassing. I don't want to get hurt. It's what it is in an accident. And I didn't want to tell you that. And so, oh, no. Well, you can see the foolishness of it all as well as the logic. Where in the Bible, back to this, my unspoken request is here tonight. Where in the Bible? Oh, I like this. Do you ever find that a Christian has to worry or be concerned because there's somebody visiting the church that night and so they're just not going to touch certain subjects or somebody unsaved back there or some rebellious child that's been disobedient, or some friend that you wish could see the truth of divine healing, where in the Bible do we find we have to temper the service or present it in such a way we don't offend anybody? Because I've got a better question. How in the world did they get in God's house? Did you invite them? What's an unsaved person doing in the body of Christ? It makes no sense. Now, I know you've been brainwashed in the denominations, and we've said it a thousand times. All you've ever heard is evangelism from the pulpit three times a week. They have four services four times a week. And we know Paul sets up the possibility in 1 Corinthians 14. We know the possibility of an unsaved person getting in the church. But what are knowingly unsaved people doing in the church? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, if an unbeliever... See, if... He doesn't say, you're going to have unbelievers there, so don't speak in tongues unless you interpret. But he says, if an unbeliever gets in or someone who's unlearned, you know, about the deeper things, spiritual things, and all of you spoke in tongues and didn't interpret, they'd think you were mad. So prophesy unless you're going to interpret, which is what he said. We're saying that for any visitor's benefit, that he says speaking in tongues is equivalent to prophecy if you interpret. How did an unsaved person get in the church? Are you inviting that husband over and over to come to church? Somehow he might get saved. He shouldn't even be here. We don't stand at the door and say, are you saved or unsaved? We have to be realistic because even Paul says, it's possible that an unbeliever can get in. The church, the body of Christ, is where the saints meet to worship. Read that book written by that author, Charismatic Body Ministry. He brings all of this out. We sell it in the bookstore. Charismatic body ministry. That the church is a place where the saints meet to worship, praise the Lord, and unsaved people can't do any of that, and be taught the Word of God. And then you go out and communicate this Word, wherever you are, housewife, work, whatever, school or whatever. And you don't preach evangelistic sermons to saints. That's so obvious, and yet I don't know why every time I mention it, it gets so quiet. Because you've been brainwashed, that's all you've ever seen. And it sounds strange, I know it sounds strange to many of you to hear that unsaved people should not be in the church of Jesus Christ. Hey, I don't care what some of you think about that. That's Bible, that's right. It's your church. What are you apologizing for that rebellious child for worrying about hurting his feelings? Well, if I got up and requested prayer for my rebellious child, he'd get worse and never come back. Well, what a confession of a parent. What kind of a parent are you? I don't care if they're 17 or 18. I don't stop spanking people because of age if they're under my roof. 
Amen. I spanked children when I was a house parent. I spanked children when they said you couldn't spank them. I spanked a girl all the way up the steps to about third floor at the Kentucky Children's Home. And she didn't do that anymore. And she didn't get mad at me. She had never been disciplined in her life. I spanked her with my hand all the way up. Teenage girl. And she didn't forget it and never resented it. In fact, I'm sure she appreciated it because she found out that there was something in life besides just going off in all directions at once. But a rebellious child? It's your church. Why should you apologize to that child? Leave the child at home and come and tell us you're just a mother and the husband isn't helping in the situation and he's 17 or she. You love that child and you want the church to agree with you and lift up that the Lord will deal with them. And sometimes he deals with them in more ways than one. Leave them at home. How did that friend get here? You had to invite them. Well, the friend isn't receiving the word. What good is it going to do for us to agree that they'll be healed? They're not going to be healed. If you have compassion and concern enough for that friend who needs to see the truth of divine healing, that's what you want to be praying about. That's the way you pray. People want me to go to the hospital and pray for a sick person. I said, have you been there? Yes. Did you take them divine healing? You know, we teach body ministry here. I guess you know that. Did you take them the truth of divine healing? If they say no, I say, well, go back and get your blessing. That's a blessing to carry them the truth. But generally they say, yes, I tried to share it with them, but they're just not ready to receive it or they don't understand it. And I thought if you went, you know, you can end that scenario any way you want in 25 words or less. I don't go. I said, be no good because I trust you. I'm sure you told them what they need to know about divine healing. And if a preacher comes and the pressure's on them and... They're not going to believe anyway. But we have this notion that if enough people go, that maybe something will work out. So where in the Bible do we find that the church is a place we have to be careful about what we say? I don't want to embarrass somebody. What are they doing there if they're going to be embarrassed? Leave them at home and make your request made known or just be bold. I don't care. Maybe that's the way they'll get saved. I love my husband. He needs salvation deliverance. Church, pray. There he sits. <laughs> that he'll repent. Because he's got a mask on here and you don't see it. And I'm just a woman and there's that 17-year-old, big old brute of a son that's incorrigible and won't obey me. But I love him. Church, pray with me. What do you care if they don't come back? What good does it do them to come in that way? Where do you get the idea the church is a place to bring your problems? That somehow you may get lucky and it'll happen that night. Now, we know that occasionally a person gets saved that's in the church of God. That's another question. As I said, we don't stand at the door. But if it's serious, serious enough that you're concerned, then do something about it. Maybe that's the only way you're going to wake that husband up or wife or whatever. Whatever. Like I told you about when I taught biblical theology, that my professor in the seminary said he was preaching this little town. He was the interim pastor and stayed in this house. The wife was a Christian, but the husband, just one of those who would never say anything, but just unregenerate, just... Every Sunday afternoon, rocked back and forth, and he'd witness to him. He'd never even answer. And he said one day he got so religiously indignant with his lack of response. He said, well, you couldn't be saved anyway unless you're elected from all eternity. And something like, obviously, you're not. He said that big brute of a farmer, about seven foot tall, stood up and ran over and fell on his shoulder and said, What do I have to do to be saved? (laughs) That's what it took. I don't know why it took him so long to tell him that. But that may be what it takes. Now, I'm not suggesting you try to do something to get that husband delivered and saved or that wife sympathetic toward the baptism of the Holy Spirit or that friend healed. But I'm saying, why... Do you want to lift a hand and ask us to agree with you about something we don't know what we're praying about? I can't release any faith on that. And if you're concerned enough about them, then 
You let the Lord lead you how to do it. But don't ever feel embarrassed. If you think they might not come back, they don't need to be here, let alone come back. If they're unsaved, incorrigible, rebellious, use your faith to get them saved, delivered, or whatever. But quit being embarrassed about a visitor maybe getting in here or the media with their mud, their lies, and their slander. I mean, if you know they're there, I'd like to know about it. We'll invite them out. I'm saying don't worry about that they might get in here and you don't know about it. I certainly don't worry about it because if I did, then I couldn't say what I've said so many nights because they have so much to misquote you about. But quit being embarrassed for the lost. Be concerned, but not embarrassed. This is the church of Jesus Christ. I don't invite a single lost person into this holy place where the saints are to worship their God. That's all you've ever seen. It's just fill up the pews with a lot of lost people and they sit there and chew their gum and roll their eyes at you because they're not spiritual and don't agree with anything. Why don't you get the word in your heart and take that word to them? Or pray for them, believe for them. You find me the verse in the Bible that says that we are to condition and program our worship and our teaching on the basis there might be somebody lost or somebody that's a visitor and wouldn't understand. Not that you run over people, that's not what we're saying. But none of this unspoken request anymore. That's not Bible, it's a carryover from denominationalism. And you just be bold about it. You either be bold with the Lord if you want us to agree. You'll just have to tell us and not be concerned about what somebody might think. It's a lost husband. It's a lost wife. It's a rebellious and lost child. Don't raise your hand for that rebellious child unless you're going to tell us. My daughter really needs prayer. Would you pray with me? Well, the Lord has taken us, I believe, another step further to make our prayers effective. Father, we trust that we will use effectively and humbly what you make available to us through the Word in such a way that our prayers more and more will come in conformity to the Word of God and we have the assurance that we receive the answers when we pray in line with the Word. And that the admonishment that we are to come to worship and praise our Lord and be taught ought not to be forgotten, as it so often is. As a church is a public meeting, which it's not. No place in the Bible have you taught us that. Closed meeting in Israel, a closed meeting in the New Testament. You'd never read a word, Lord, in the Bible outside that one mention of Paul. The church is a place where the unregenerate come to get saved. A contradiction. Because the church is the body of Christ. The church is not a building with chairs. And help us more and more to be willing to admit just the way it is the pattern of the church and thus become more concerned that we, each of us, take the responsibility to move out day to day with the witness of this word and not hope that somehow a preacher or minister will say something that might get a loved one saved or a friend or healed or baptized in the Spirit. Lord, help the people to see it's their responsibility and not to drag in by the collar those who have no love for you, who resent much of what is said from the pulpit. And then we know that you have preserved some to this hour because of the faith, the faith of a wife or a parent, or they wouldn't even be here on this earth. Show them the seriousness. But show the body is our prayer, that we should be specific, unashamed, and bold, with fearless confidence, making our requests made known unto God and to the brothers and sisters, if we want them to believe with us 
is my prayer in Jesus' name. For a complete list of Dr. Freeman's tapes, books, and tracks, write to Faith Ministries, Post Office Box 1156, Warsaw, Indiana, 46580.